Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Daily Bay Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Dan, and this is signed on the 5th of June, 2024. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So I'm back, guys. Sorry for the last few episodes that I have missed there, but I am back today. Obviously, you guys know I mentioned last week that I was having surgery. Unfortunately, it has taken me longer to recover from that than I would have liked. I've been in and out of sleep on painkillers, just not been a very fun time. I'm definitely still not at 100%, so you may notice a bit of, I guess, like less bullish energy today than I usually bring to the episodes because of that. But I felt like if I missed another episode today, I'd just feel so bad about it. And and I didn't want to do that to you guys again. Uh, and once again, thank you to Whack Whack Attack for filling in. He covered the Ethereum news on his show Rocket Fuel while I had been away the last few days and missing episodes there. But I'm back today with a bit to talk about. Not too many tabs here, but there is a bunch of stuff that's going to fall off of uh, the, the tabs, the Twitter tabs that I have open here in order for me to talk about. And I think today I want to start off with a discussion around the ETH ETFs. Now, of course, we don't have to speculate around the ETH ETFs being approved or not because they were already approved approved as we all know, but now we're left speculating on when they're actually going to start trading and what impact that is going to have on the price of ETH. Now, of course, there has been many takes given on this on crypto Twitter, on various different podcasts, everywhere that you look, everyone has their own take on this. And I, of course, have my own. I think that I've given some of this before, but I felt like it was worth reiterating. But the first question I want to answer for you guys is when exactly are these ETH ETFs going live for trading? When are we going to see those first inflows coming in to ETH like we see for BTC? Because BTC today actually had one of its biggest inflow days of almost, I believe, a billion dollars or over a billion dollars into the BTC ETS. Fidelity in particular had a really big day. So yeah, when are we going to see that for those uh, flows for ETH? When is ETH going to get some love here? From what I've seen, the earliest that we can expect this is still the end of June, I think. There hasn't been too much movement on the S-1 forms, but uh, there is movement there. And obviously they're going to start trading at some point. We're just left wondering and speculating on the timeline. I think end of June, you know, into July probably looks good there. You know, and people argue whether it's bullish or bearish to launch kind of uh, sooner rather than later and so on and so forth. I think speculating on that's probably not the greatest use of time, to be honest, because you can't prove the uh, one or the other. Like if the ETFs were to go live trading next week, you couldn't prove that it would have been more bullish if they were to go live trading next month because we don't live in that reality, right? So I think that's not really something to speculate on. Uh, because it's kind of a waste of time. I mean, I think that overall, no matter what position you take on the ETH ETFs, uh, th these new flows coming into ETH that are only going to BTC and no other assets, because no other assets have an ETF, uh, is bullish for the price of ETH, because I don't think that anyone expects ETH uh, or anyone is going to be selling their ETH, right, at this point in time, but certainly not long-term investors thinking that ETH has topped or anything like that. I mean, we're not even at all-time high yet. But I think one of the biggest open questions around the ETH ETFs and their impact on the price of ETH is around what's going to happen with ETH E, Grayscale's ETH E trust product, which as you guys know, is a closed ended trust that's being converted into an open ETF uh, that they're, they're following the same process that they did with GBTC converting into an ETF. Now, the reason why there is much speculation around this is because as we saw with GBTC, around half of that AUM came out of GBTC once it converted. It didn't happen all at once, but it did happen over a few weeks. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a sell pressure because of that, right? The price of BTC did actually go down after the BTC ETF started trading. And it only started going up, I believe, or at least got back to the price it was when the BTC ETFs were approved, I believe a full month later, right? So there was definitely an impact here, not just from those outflows, but also from the speculators selling off because obviously we had a long speculative phase right right up until the BTC ETFs were approved of at least three months where the market was pricing in these approvals. Whereas for Ether, it has been the opposite, where essentially right up until we knew that we we're going to get approved on, I believe it was May 20th when the news first broke, ETH uh, was being priced as if the ETFs were going to get denied. And that's why ETH was at 3K. And then, of course, ETH did its one of its biggest candles, if not its biggest candle, daily candle in history, and went from like 3K to 4K in a single day there. Now, of course, since then, ETH has kind of stayed around 3,800, hasn't really gone above that, obviously hasn't gone to all-time high or anything like that. Uh, and people are speculating, you know, is this because the market expects there to be massive outflows from the ETH product like there were was from GBTC? And of course, there are both bullish and bearish arguments to be made here. The, the bearish argument, I mean, the clear bearish argument is that there's going to be five, six billion dollars, which is about 50% of what ETH AUM is right now, of ETH that is sold uh, pretty much over you know a few weeks after the ETH ETF start trading, which is sell pressure that the market has to eat. That is the max bearish scenario, I think, when, you, when you're looking at it from that perspective. I don't think that you would see more or, or uh, more kind of outflows than that. I don't even think you're going to see that many outflows. And this brings me to my kind 
a bullish case. And the bullish case here is a few different things. And I think there's actually more of a bull case to be made than a bear case about ETH. The bull, the bull case falls into basically uh, two main, main kind of buckets here. The first bucket is the fact that ETH e is trading basically at par at this point. It is not at a discount anymore like it was. I believe it was at like a 25% discount uh, right up until May 20th, I believe. But now if I look at the ETH e discount, I'm just bringing it up on my other screen here. You won't be able to see this because I have to open it in a in a different window here. But the discount is around 1.7%. So it's essentially at par now, right? Or it's essentially at, I guess, like uh, near the, what the fee is uh, for ETH -E here. So from that perspective, if you were really, really itching to sell out of ETH -E and sell out of ETH altogether and go to cash and put your money elsewhere, like it stands to reason that you wouldn't just wait another, I don't know how many weeks until the ETH -E product gets converted to an ETF and then sell, right? So... It, there's an open question around like how many people are actually waiting for this. Whereas I think the opposite is true, where essentially a lot of people bought that discount and are up, you know, a lot right now. Because if you bought the 20% discount, you're basically up a free 20% ETH denominated, not USD denominated but also USD denominated because ETH went up by 20%, right, uh, from that trade. So you're sitting on, on some healthy profits there, both both against USD and obviously, um, you know, get, uh, benchmarking against ETH spot as well because you got to buy at a discount there. So if you're in that position, like you're probably not going to be waiting until ETH converts into an ETF in order to sell out of it uh, and go to cash. Maybe you want to get out of that product and go to a different ETF. Like that is a net zero thing. That is not sell pressure. That is essentially a wash because you're going to be rebuying it and the new ETF anyway. So essentially that nets out to zero. So that I wouldn't consider to be sell pressure. So we're talking about the actual net sell pressure here from those people that just want to sell when it gets converted for whatever reason. It doesn't really strike me as a, as a, as a good reason to sell out here, um, then essentially what, what's going to happen is that I believe there's not going to be much of those people. Now, the second case here is that I believe Grayscale actually learned their lesson from GBTC, and I do not think that their fee is going to stay as high as it was, because the reason why there were so many outflows from GBTC is because they kept the fee very, very high compared to the other ETF fees. So anyone who wanted to be, even stay in an ETF would still sell out of the... Um, of the other product, right? They would they would sell out, they would go to, to cash initially and then have to rebuy as part of the other ETFs. Yes, it would net out to zero, but it does still count for that, you know, that period of time. There is that kind of, I guess, like delta period between like when they sell and when it gets rebought in the other ETFs. And then of course you had the narrative on top of that, people looking at these outflows being like, oh my God, look how much is being sold, so on and so forth. And, and then the, the rest is history as we've seen from the, the price action there. So th there's that perspective, but um, I, I, I struggle to think that Grayscale is going to do the same thing with ETHE because if they already know what it's going to look like, at least 50% of the uh, AUM is just going to get out of that product altogether and go to an, a competing product or just leave crypto altogether, then why would they do that to themselves? Like, it doesn't make any sense at all. So what makes more sense is that they're actually going to lower the fee. Maybe it won't be as low as some of the other ETFs out there, but they're going to lower the fee much lower than what it was for GBTC when it converted on their ETH -E product, which should result in much less outflows. I do believe that if they do leave it the same as it is now with a huge fee, they're going to see massive outflows of it. And I still believe that's not going to be bearish because it's just going to net out to zero. I don't really think there's going to be that many outflows from ETH -E that are just going to go to cash and go somewhere else and aren't going to rebuy ETH eventually. But I'm just not seeing the like huge bear case here. And I'm not even mentioning the fact that this is just one product with one set of outflows when we're going to be having all of these other ETH ETFs going live, bringing in fresh money, uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in the first few weeks, right? If not tens of billions of dollars in the, in the first couple of months. And that's just the ETF money. Then throw in the money within crypto or outside of the ETFs that's going to be going into ETH still as well. And essentially, you will have more demand than even 50 plus percent of outflows from, from ETH -E here. So I'm just not seeing the bear case. But I think that's maybe particularly one reason why the market may be a little bit kind of weary about bidding ETH right now, which to me, as I just explained, seems insane. But that's kind of where we're at right now. But in terms of the longer term here, this is this is something that would I, I see playing out over maybe the next three months all up. Like if we kind of take the whole thing from today to when the e ETFs are trading to what the ETH -E, uh, flows uh, outflows look like and when they kind of stop and just plateau there, I think you could say two to three months is, is the bulk of it there. So that's like the medium term. That's not the short term, it's the medium term, but it's definitely not the long term. If we extrapolate this out and go long term a year from now, and we take all of the bull start bullish cases and all the bullish energy that ETH is going to get, not only because of the ETS, but everything else. 
over the next year, it stands to reason that ETH is going to be a lot higher than what it is now. So if you're a long-term investor, worrying about these day-to-day -day movements where you're like, oh, ETH is underperforming some random meme coin on the day, or ETH is underperforming, even though it just went up like 30%, <laughs> you know, the other week, it, put, it went up in market cap by like $80 billion, guys, which is greater than every other asset's market cap. Like if you actually go to CoinGecko and look at the top assets by market cap, everything except BNB is below 80 billion, everything. Like Solana at eight, at around 79 billion, you have, and then from there it's XRP at 30 billion, Doge at 23 billion, like everything is less than that. And ETH did that in one day. So of course the market needs to digest this over the short term, guys. Like these people who took that trade, imagine if you bought ETH at 3K as a trader thinking, you know, ETH, ETH looks really like a really good buy here. You didn't know anything about the ETFs, but ETH looks like a really good buy here. I'm gonna, you know, take the trade here. And then automatically within like a day, you make 30% on your money. Of course, there's gonna be some profit taking there. And then of course, there's going to be people that were already holding ETH, maybe from like $1,000 or $1,500 who are like, okay, well, this is a pretty good time for me to, to, to cash out some, you know, I've, I'm up a lot of my money right now. I'm going to uh, gonna sell off a little bit here. So there's just that natural market dynamics that happen over the short term. And keep in mind, guys, this is only two weeks ago and ETH is still at 3,800 at time of recording here, going into a market where BTC is about to go back into price discovery. BTC inflows into the ETFs are uh, once again, very, very high. The ETH ETF is about to go public. BlackRock and Larry Fink and, 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 and other big TradFi firms are making a heavy push into crypto, into on-chain stuff, into tokenization. The whole on-chain ecosystem is growing faster than it ever has. Coinbase has their smart wallet coming out soon. L2s are taking off in a really big way. Like there's just so much stuff happening on the bullish side of things that if you're bearish right now, you probably have some kind of mental illness at where it's like, I don't know, bear-itis or something like that, or some kind of disease that makes you a bear. Because I see basically zero reasons to be bearish. Even over the short to medium term, I see zero reasons to be bearish. I see a million reasons to be bullish over the longer term here, but that's how I, I generally see it right now. And I know I've gone for a little while on this point here, but I felt like it was worth reiterating because of the fact that people, for some reason, are like, oh, why is ETH underperforming? It's like, what do you mean underperforming? <laughs> like, it's just crazy. Like, ETH it was at three thousand dollars two weeks ago, guys. It's at almost four thousand now. And I bet, like, I, I, I mean, I'm not gonna put any money on this, of course. Maybe I'll just do like a social bet here that we could see ETH at all time high within the next few weeks, if that. I really do think that ETH is, is literally almost, like once it passes 4K, that's it. It's going all-time high. All-time high is around 5K. I mean, I think 4,900 or something like that, depending on the exchange that you look at. And once we're there and BTC is already in price discovery and everything else is going bullish and mainstream media is now covering stuff again, we have all these ETF inflows still coming in. What do you think is going to happen to the price of, I guess, like not only ETH and BTC, of course, but everything? We're going to go into a proper bull market and that is going to be that kind of, I guess, like final six months or so of like the craziness of, of the bull market, I believe. It could extend longer than that. We've never had a bull market before when we had something like an ETF product live for BTC and of course soon for ETH. Uh, but that's my general thinking on the markets right now. So anyone who's bearish, has a disease, in my opinion, or a mental illness. It's just, there's no reason to be bearish here, guys. And I'm not even, I didn't even talk about all of the positive political stuff that's been happening. I know that that Fit 21 bill was vetoed by Biden, but honestly, I don't even think that's anything bearish. I think that's just like politics. At the end of the day, it's going to get sorted out. It's going to get ironed out. I think that the shift in the regulatory landscape and the shift on the on the pol political side is still very pro-crypto. I do think that the pro-crypto uh, candidates, the pro-crypto politicians, the pro-crypto kind of like um, lobbying firms, they're all making huge, huge strides in getting uh, crypto as a central part of the US political system, especially in a election year, where now you have, uh, you know, the Republican uh, frontrunner Trump basically going all in on crypto. Whether you like Trump or not is irrelevant here. Whether you agree with the policies of one party or another is irrelevant here. What's relevant to us in the crypto sphere, uh, for, for, for better or worse, is how crypto is being treated here. And even if it is just like pandering and LARPing, at the end of the day, if it's a net positive for crypto, then we should be cheering for it, I think, from that perspective. But I understand that politics obviously goes a lot, lot larger than that. I understand that a lot of people aren't single issue voters. I personally aren't either. I mean, I wouldn't vote for someone just because they have a positive crypto policy if all their other policies were absolutely garbage. And by garbage, I mean, didn't align with my views and beliefs and things. Obviously, that's an opinion. It's not a fact there. But I'm I'm generally not a single, single issue voter. But I think that even if it's not just a single issue thing, even if crypto is maybe just like one issue that you care about, but it's a big issue, then you will make your voice heard at the polls this year. And I think that 
And both parties understand that crypto has way more people that are pro crypto than anti crypto. I actually don't think there's anyone who's anti crypto. Like, do, do you like this? And I think I actually did this this um, this thought experiment a few months ago on the refuel, where I basically said, "Is there a group of people large enough?" that are that are so anti-crypto that that is their single issue that they would vote on like is there someone that exists that would not vote for biden uh sorry that would not vote for uh, the republicans if they, I mean, let's say they're already a republican let's say they're already a fan of trump is there someone who would not vote for trump and the republicans just because they're pro crypto and go vote for biden i don't think that person exists right so i don't think that the anti-side is a winning side to be on i think the pro side is definitely a winning side to be on and i think that the politicians are wising up to that in a very very quick way and that's why we've seen a, a, a kind of a positive shift there. Now, as I said, I went through all the bull cases before without even mentioning the politics stuff, which is a huge bullish case for crypto too. So I guess wrapping up here, there's zero reasons to be bearish, guys. Like I don't see any. I'm extremely bullish. I'm extremely bullish on ETH in particular, obviously, extremely bullish on Ethereum. And I'm very, very bullish on TradFi getting involved in a really big way within the Ethereum ecosystem on the real world asset tokenization front. I really do think that within the next couple of years, you're going to see a stock exchange built on crypto rails built within the Ethereum ecosystem that is a fully tokenized stock exchange, fully regulated tokenized stock exchange that is accessible to the TradFi ecosystem. Uh, and it's all basically on chain. I do think we're going to see that in the next couple of years. And that to me is like one of the end games. And one of the reasons why I was so excited about on-chain finance or DeFi to begin with is for it to basically be integrated within the TradFi world and just make a 100, 1000 times better financial experience for not only people that exist exist uh, as part of the financial system today, but also the billions of people who do not have access to a financial system. This is mass adoption, guys, happening before your eyes. This is giving the people who are disenfranchised in, uh, on the financial side of things a way to get involved with the financial system. And this is the complete and total globalization of the financial system, which, you know, some people may think is dystopian, but I actually think it's a net positive. The more people that are connected, together via value, not just via the internet. The internet obviously connects people in a social way, in a communications way, but the value layer of the internet has been missing until we had crypto. And that is what's going to connect the world. That is the final missing piece. And that is what's going to, uh, in my opinion, usher in a new era of human prosperity because we're gonna have much better financial rails and we're gonna have much more opportunity afforded to billions of people who haven't had those opportunities before. So I'm super bullish on all of that. Now on that note, I'm gonna end my bullish rant there. Gonna move on to a bunch of the other stuff that I wanted to talk about. So first up is this ETH roadmap website that I've covered before from ETHWAVE. So this is ethroadmap.com. They have updated this website in a big way here. So essentially what it is, is basically taking Vitalik's uh, roadmap diagram that you all know and love and put it on this website and made it interactive. So essentially you can scroll down and see uh, dates associated with all of these different um, upgrades, EIP numbers, uh, so on and so forth. If you know, if you go, if you start at the top here, you can actually look at the merge and, and click into it and it will show you an expanded view of what the merge part of Vitalik's roadmap looks like with a bunch of different items here that you can again click into. So if you click into them, you'll get a bit of information about this with some resources here. This is constantly being updated, guys. This is not like it's final form or anything like that, but this is very, very cool. Uh, and I mean, you can go check out ETH's wave, ETH Wave's tweet for an expanded uh, kind of spiel on what has been updated here and what's going on here. Uh, but I'm very glad this exists because I think the Ethereum roadmap is definitely something that a lot of people don't have much knowledge of uh, because of the fact that it is vast, right? It's like a 10 year roadmap. It is quite technical. There is a lot of different resources that you need to kind of consume to understand what's going on. There's just so many moving parts to it. So being able to do this in a one-stop shop website like the ethroadmap.com is uh, is awesome. And I'm very glad this exists here. So you can go check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Uh, one bit of feedback that I did want to give though to Ethwave, if you're listening, um, please change the background. <laughs> I, I I don't think the background, like I, I like the ETH logo, but I don't think this background lends itself to legibility. I mean, it's not hard to read anything for me, but I don't know. I just feel like it's a bit of a weird background. Maybe if you had like a, uh, I don't know, like a gray background where essentially uh, you could have like a faded ETH logo in the background and it was it was like dark gray or black or like a dark mode or something like that. It'd look better. I'm not a designer, uh, but yeah, right now, I don't know. It, it doesn't look that great. And honestly, like I'm just being honest here because I want this website to get more eyeballs on it. It makes it look a little bit cheap, uh, I think, because I, I don't think many websites have these image backgrounds these days. It's definitely something from like a, an older website design um, uh, kind of paradigm there. So that's my only bit of feedback there. Otherwise, other than that, I'm happy with everything. I mean, the information on here is phenomenal 
phenomenal. I really, really do love uh, everything going on here. And I understand that this is a volunteer thing. No one's paying you to do this ETH wave and no one's um, you know, paying you to, to maintain this or put this together. But if you do need help in any way at all, I'm happy to help uh, as best I can. So just feel free to DM me or reach out to me there. Uh, but yeah, anyway, you guys can go check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so one thing that Rockapool has been heavily criticized for over, I guess, like years now at this point is the design of the RPL token and the fact that in order to become a Rockapool node, node operator, you need to have exposure to the RPL token. You need to stake a portion of uh, the RPL token or, uh, or I guess like a portion of your holdings of the RPL token in order to become a node operator here. And this, of course, has resulted in a lack of scalability for the Rockapool protocol and also people getting annoyed that when the RPL price falls and then when the ratio falls, you have to stake even more RPL in order to claim your RPL rewards uh, when you're staking as a node operator and also in order to, uh, if you wanted to, withdraw your stake from the system. Now, of course, there has been a lot of work being uh, done over the, I guess, like last year or so in changing this and basically revamping the entire RPL token here. So if you want to go check this out, uh, Jasper has a great... Um, a tweet here explaining some of this uh, with a bunch of replies, uh, but also a link to the new tokenomics proposal. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But the reason why I'm highlighting this isn't in particular for the token itself, uh, because you guys know I try to avoid highlighting any token except really ETH on the refuel, and I don't want to give investment advice here. But the reason why I'm highlighting this is because these this tokenomics revamp has a very big impact on the protocol itself, because it should result in the protocol um, kickstarting its growth again and re resulting in more node operators coming online, which is basically the North Star for Rockapool, right? They want it, more node operators coming online. They want more validators coming online as part of the Rockapool ecosystem here. Uh, and I be do believe this tokenomics revamp or rework is going to be uh, instrumental in allowing that to happen. So you can go check this out. I'll look at it in the YouTube description below for you to do so here. Yeah, I'm not going to summarize it because there's a lot in that, that's going into this. And Jasper would be someone that you guys should talk to in the Rockapool Discord or in the Daily Great Discord if you want to learn more about this. He's definitely the resident community expert on the Rockapool uh, tokenomics revamp here. So yeah, if you want to talk to me, I guess you can just tag him in Rockapool in the Rockapool Discord or the Daily Great Discord. He's always happy to chat about everything Rockapool. All right, so a coffee here has introduced a new Dune Analytics dashboard uh, titled Rollup Economics uh, Blob Fees. This update to the Rollup Economics dashboard shows how much L2s are paying for blob fees. When L2s submit blobs, they pay both a normal gas fee and a separate blob fee for the transaction. So this uh, dashboard, I don't know if it's linked here, actually. I don't know if uh, if Coffee has linked it. Maybe he has. No, uh, I think I've highlighted this dashboard before on... Um, on the refuel, but essentially uh, it's just another dashboard to track everything got to do with blobs uh, and with L2s generally and with rollups, I guess. Obviously, uh, I've mentioned Hill Dobby's dashboard before on the refuel. He's also got a blob related dashboard here. And actually, no, um, Coffee did link their rollup economics dashboard, but you can check out here. Um, and the reason I like this dashboard so much is because it's not just got to do with blobs, but it's just got to do with like roll up economics in general and what that looks like you know what do the what are the rollups paying for fees you know how much are they making on the execution side of things you know wh wh what's the difference between the data fees and the execution fees over time and in a really nice easily to digest dashboard here uh which you can see as i as I'm, I'm showing here on my screen right now so you can go check this out i'll link it in the youtube description below but i think what's most in most interesting about monitoring here is basically that a lot of people have been flooding this recently which is just weird to me where they basically say that and I think I've covered this on the refuel before, but they basically have this narrative of, oh, if everyone's just using uh, the L2s and if the L2s have really cheap data costs on L1, then how does ETH accrue value if basically the gas fees are low on L1 because everyone's on L2? And the reason why this is insane to me is for a few different reasons, but the main two is basically that one, okay, so you fighted ETH L1 when it had high fees, and now you're fighting it when it has low fees, like we can't win, and just it's a really annoying narrative. And two, you're assuming that the aggregate demand for data from these L2s doesn't keep going up and to the right, when it will, because the more these L2 scale execution, the more data they use, the more data gets posted down to L1. And as I've said before, we can expect to live in a world 
at some point in the future, maybe like 10 years in the future or something like that, where there is literally tens of trillions, hundreds of trillions of transactions being processed each and every day. And if they're only paying a very, very small fee, like you actually net it out and say, okay, well, each of these transactions is net paying 0.00001 or whatever cents of a fee. If, you, if there are hundreds of trillions of these transactions happening each and every day, that adds up to tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars of fee revenue overall for these protocols. And I think people just aren't, I guess, like, tuned to this paradigm that's coming where essentially they think that as it exists today is, is what we're going to get to. But it, that's so untrue. We're, we're so early on the tech side of things. And every time that we scale up, every single time we scale up, whether that be at L1 or L2, that scalability gets filled very quickly. And then we have even more economic activity being generated. And we haven't even onboarded like 0.01% of the world. We probably That's probably all we've onboarded, to be honest, on chain. We have another 99.9% .9 to go, guys. So there's no reason to be bearish on, I guess, like ETH fee capture and ETH value accrual from fee capture because it's going to go up and to the right. And as I've described before as well, it is not even like the top thing to be bullish on ETH for. The top thing to be bullish on ETH and, and its value accrual is its use as a money and as a store of value. And that is not going to be replaced, I, be I believe, even in like 10, 20 years time within the Ethereum ecosystem. I do believe ETH is going to be dominant there and remain dominant. And I think that the only thing that will come close to it will be stable coins, but they feel a completely different, I guess, like uh, area where no one's storing their value in US dollar stable coins for long periods of time. Maybe you go to US dollar stable coins to pay some bills, or maybe you're bearish on the market for the next six months. You sit in stables for six months. But if you are wanting to buy a store of value for the long term, you're buying ETH or you're buying BTC, right? And if you're an Ethereum native or you want to do stuff on chain, uh, you, you're basically buying ETH to do that. So yeah, I don't know. These bearish cases that people come up with, they're so convoluted. They just make you more bullish because if you have to go so far to come up with a bearish case for ETH, then in reality, what you're trying to do is just confirm an already bearish bias that you have uh, by making a convoluted argument, which doesn't really match with reality. So that's my, my view on that one there. But you can go check out the Roll Up Economics dashboard. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so Connex has gone through a massive rebranding here. They are now known as Everclear. So I should disclose here, I'm an investor in Connex, which is now Everclear here. But what they're calling Everclear is the first clearing layer. So they say here, Everclear coordinates the global settlement of liquidity between chains, solving fragmentation for modular blockchains. I guess put another way, this is one of those solutions that I've been talking about for quite a while around chain abstraction, essentially making it so that you don't really necessarily need to know what chain you're on, or I guess like what L2 you're on, or you don't need to basically bridge between different L2s because you'll be able to do things cross L2 in an interoperable way, in an atomic composable way uh, via things like Everclear. And the, the way Everclear achieves this is through Intense. Now, Intense is something that's been talked about for quite a while. I believe there's a ton tons of podcasts on this at this point, but the way to, I guess, materially describe, or I guess to pragma pragmatically describe what, in what intents are, is that if you've ever used cow swap before, that is a form of an intent because the cow and cow swap stands for coincidence of wants. It's basically bringing two parties together that have uh, something that they need uh, and settling that in an intent based way. So essentially when you go to cow swap today and say, hey, I've got USDC, I want to trade a thousand USDC for ETH. What happens is that there's a bunch of off-chain solvers that take that order, they fulfill that order for you in uh, uh, through Intense, and then they basically pay the gas fees on-chain for you, and they grab the liquidity from anywhere they can. And speaking of CowSwap, they actually just went live on Arbitrum, their first L2, which is really awesome to see, because that's one big complaint that I've had, because I love CowSwap so, so much, but they haven't traditionally been live on L2s. But essentially what they're doing is they're sourcing the, the liquidity from wherever they, can, wherever they can get it. And the same is going to be true for Everclear here, where it's sourcing the, uh, whether it be liquidity or the the, uh, the, um, the messaging that wants to be passed via the intents, or whatever you're doing here, sourcing it from anywhere that it can get it, any of the supported chains, and not just chains, but any of the supported infrastructure that it can get it from here. So I'm super bullish on this, honestly, even though I, I mean, I'm an investor in Connextia, I would be saying it whether I'm an investor or not, because I think I've been, I guess, like banging this drum for years now, where anything that leads to further abstraction for the end user is, is good. And anything that does this in a way that's secure and does this in a way that is provably secure is good. And that's exactly what Everclear is here, because it's done it, doing it in a protocol enforced way, it's doing it as a protocol, uh, rather than doing it as a 
kind of like totally off-chain, pseudo-centralized, trust me bro thing, right? It's trying to do it in a decentralized protocol driven way here. But yeah, but anyway, you can go check out Everclear for yourself. I'll link this in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, lastly here, some older news that I haven't covered. Uh, this is about a week old news, but it's pretty bullish. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about TradFi getting more involved with crypto. So this news comes out of MasterCard, where they said here on Twitter, MasterCard crypto credential has gone on live with its first peer-to-peer -peer transactions. This solution not only replaces complex wallet addresses with user-friendly aliases, but also makes sending blockchain transactions secure, transparent, and accessible. So essentially this is MasterCard's, I guess, like crypto wallets, but I... I guess like I kind of um, struggle to call it an actual wallet. So essentially what happens is that, as you can see here, crypto exchange users will be able to send and receive crypto using their MasterCard card crypto credential aliases instead of the typically long and complex blockchain addresses. So essentially it's kind of like a MasterCard version of ENS, but for... Uh, but for, uh, I guess, like uh, TradFi, uh, I guess like for a bridge between TradFi and crypto, right? And there's more information and a video about how this works uh, in, this, um, in this blog post there, which I'll link in the YouTube description below. But again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the fact that there's going to be more and more of these integrations happening. They're going to happen much faster than you think they are because the race is on now. You know, I think Larry Fink, or BlackRock CEO, whenever he goes on Bloomberg or whatever other mainstream media and starts talking about tokenization, you bet your ass all these TradFi companies are like, what's tokenization? Oh shit, do we have a tokenization strategy? Oh, we need to be in this. We need to do this. Who do we talk to? Blah, blah, blah. And they're doing this because they're all in competition with each other. So they need to stay on the bleeding edge here. And if they're being caught off guard, you're going to have these executives at these companies come down to these product teams and say, hey, what's our tokenization strategy? And the product teams have to have something or at least have to have something that looks like something. They can't be like, what's tokenization? That, that won't stand because someone will get fired and, and someone will be replaced. And then they'll, you know, there'll be a tokenization strategy. So that's exactly what's happening here. And as I said, the next couple of years is going to be very pivotal to this. And I do think it's going to all culminate in a on-chain stock exchange completely powered by, uh, you know, by the on-chain ecosystem, but it blends the TradFi ecosystem into it in a way that we haven't seen before. But anyway, on that note, uh, as I said, you can check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below, but I think that's going to be it for today. Hopefully going forward, there's not going to be any more missed episodes outside of the random rug fuel that happens every now and again. Um, I don't know if I'll be doing like episodes uh, every kind of second day or something like that. I think people have suggested to me that, hey, if you're finding it hard to keep up with the daily cadence, why don't you do an episode every second day or an episode every third day or something like that? And I don't think that would work. There's too much going on in the industry, guys. And I get so much enjoyment out of doing the refuel that anytime that I miss an episode, I feel really bad and I feel shitty because it's like, oh, wow, I'd love to do an episode. It makes me feel good. I love seeing the community get, uh, you know, get informed and I love being a counter to all the bad information out there. So I think I'm going to stick to the daily cadence as for, you know, for now. I'm definitely going to change my relationship with crypto as I've discussed before, where I'm going to limit my time on Twitter and Discord, which I've been terrible at lately, but I'm still going to try um, and make sure that I'm not exposed to a lot of the toxic side of this industry. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to give that little heads up there. But I think, as I said, on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.